reflect again with you folks during a worship hour. I deeply appreciate the special music we're having today. It adds much to our worship experience, and I appreciate that. Does everybody have a copy of the notes that I have up here? All right, it looks like everybody has gotten one of them. In both the Old and the New Testaments, the Bible talks about a very special group of people that help to finish the work. That's what I want to address here this morning as we consider God's special forces. On a summer evening several years ago, a friend of ours by the name of Daryl was relaxing on his porch with a couple friends. Suddenly they saw billowing smoke arising a little distance away. They jumped into his car to see what was happening, and down the street a house was on fire. Screams were coming from inside. Daryl dashed through the front door down a burning hall and found a mother with five children. Over the next few minutes, he rescued each one out of that burning structure. They were saved, but he sustained severe burns to his hands, neck, and body. Daryl lived, but he went through many operations to function again. Daryl was a hero. He risked his life to save someone else. A couple of years ago, Jeannie and I had the pleasure of giving he and his wife Bible studies, and they are now members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church here in the high desert. Amen. Risking everything for another individual will be one of the driving forces of the 144,000. Ellen White said to those who have this spirit, God speaks, come out from among them and be ye separate. Our work for the salvation of souls will not be done without what? Without a conflict. We shall have to practice self-denial, overcome inclination, relinquish the spirit and passions of the world, and here it is, and be ready to sacrifice even life itself, if need be, just like Darrell, for Christ's sake. I am reminded of Christ's words, then said Jesus unto his disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake will find it. There is much to discover about this group of people. Things all end-time Christians really need to know about. Just by way of intro in the Old Testament, the little horn of Daniel 8's ram symbolizes the 144,000. The barley harvest in the Old Testament symbolizes the 144,000. The wheat harvest, the great multitude. The first seal in the book of Revelation of the seven seals is another symbol of the 144,000. Each of those is a special topic in itself to present. Seventh-day Adventists love the following quotation from Ellen White. Let us strive with all the power that God has given to us to be what? Among the 144,000. I'm sure you've all read this quotation many times. Let us do all that we can to help others to gain heaven. This assumes that the 144,000 will gain heaven and it is a wonderful thing to be among that group of people. It has almost become, and I'm really going to push this into the corner, this has almost become a fairy tale. Thinking about being part of this forever, may I say vacationing group in heaven, 
but desire often fails to bring reality. Such fantasy denies the journey required to be in that group. To be among the 144,000 means knowing something very special and willing to risk your life, risk everything. Well, who are they? What does it mean to be among the 144,000? To begin with, we turn first to Revelation 7, which is one of our key chapters. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. If this angel is ascending, that means he must have sometime in the past descended. And we'll hit that in a moment. Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees till we have sealed the servants of God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, and here's the number, 144,000, of all the tribes of the children of Israel. These and other verses are loaded with details about this special group of people. Number one, the owner of the seal is God, the living God. That means it is sacred and heaven-related. It will be a gift to the 144,000. The angel ascending from the east is Christ, who is supervising the sealing. He is symbolically already on earth for a mission. He came down on another symbolic mission, and that's in Revelation 10.1. East means that he is on a deliverance mission. East in prophecy always represents deliverance, that where the sun is coming up in the east. Those sealed servants are or followers of God who despise sin. Location of the seal, the forehead, meaning the person has cognitively become totally his. It is a sign that they have become a citizen of the kingdom of God. Note the mark of Satan's kingdom is also on the forehead and on the hand. The mark of the beast, it is called. The seal of the Antichrist, Babylon, in Revelation 17, 5. They have irrevocably decided to follow the Antichrist beast. The seal of God is also a symbol and a sign of God's protection that will occur during the time of Jacob's trouble. Number five, the number sealed 144,000. Twelve as a point of orientation is a kingdom number. This is how it is enlarged in the Jewish people. Want, if the Jewish people wanted to emphasize a number, they made a square root of it, in this case, 144. If they wanted to emphasize it first, they multiply it by 1,000, thus 144,000. This number is an extreme Hebrew emphasis that God's kingdom, his church, is now being complete. These people will make up God's kingdom the number is complete, and we'll address how that number, what it means to each one of us this morning as we near our sermon. It is a judicial statement that the judgment is finished. Twelve tribes of Israel, there are many who believe this is literal Israel. A study of the Jewish people in relation to history is important. The northern ten tribes have really been lost into history. Christ's true followers are noted in Galatians 3, 28 and 29. As Abraham's seed, those 12 tribes reflect a cross-section of individuals who will be saved that in that kingdom number. They reflect characteristics of each of those tribes. At the end, they cannot be only Jews which we will show you as we go along further here this morning. 
The word sealed in the Greek means a sign of ownership. When sealed, these people eternally belong to God as his citizens. Their citizenship papers, if you please, is recorded on their foreheads. This group is an echo of Daniel 7, 14. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and people of every language worshiped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. That is the kingdom of the 144,000. It's amazing what these three short verses tell us that we have just read. The United States military has many different special operative forces. They are involved in covert intelligence operations, penetrating the enemy lines, identifying targets, knowing the right language, and assuring a successful mission. The Navy SEALs were the ones who penetrated Pakistan, landing in Osama bin Laden's compound, and then entered his house. The Green Berets are also one of the toughest units, even working behind enemy lines. Many of the objectives of the Special Ops forces are the same as the 144,000. Intelligence operations, identifying outreach targets, knowledgeable of who they represent, penetrating and working behind enemy lines, knowing the right language, and also willing to risk everything. How do we identify the 144,000 today? How do we become part of that group? Let's begin. An important key, the 144,000 are usually associated with another group of people. In Revelation 7, our key chapter, they are associated with a great multitude. And after these things, after the 144,000 are introduced, I look, that's John, and behold a great multitude which no one could number of all nations, tribes and people, and excuse me, tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands. Where are they? They're standing before the throne of God. White means they are pure, without spot. Sounds like they are similar to the 144,000. Palm branches support a victory celebration, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to God, and who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. That large group of people, the Bible says, are translated without seeing death. They came through the time of tribulation, Revelation 7, 14, or Jacob's trouble. Here is how those two groups are further referenced in Revelation chapter 7 and 14. The 144,000 is mentioned first. The great multitude is the great final group of the saved. With Christ on Mount Zion, they are before the throne with the Lamb. Sounds very similar, doesn't it? It's fascinating. The 144,000 are being sealed as they are introduced to us in Revelation 7. Then there is a time of tribulation. The four winds are then let loose. The next scene is a great multitude in the heavenly kingdom who have been translated without seeing death. Being sealed. Great tribulation, multitude translated, having gone through the great tribulation. Let's look deeper. Then one of the elders, and this is a very fascinating part of the book of Revelation, one of the 24 elders has now come to John, and he's chiding John a little bit in these verses. But notice what happens. And then one of the elders asked me, John, these dressed in long white robes, who are they? And where have they come from? So I said to him, my Lord. So, John, so this is John responding to this 24 elder. My Lord, you know the answer. 
Then he said, one of the 24 elders, these are they who have come out of great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason they are before the throne of God, and they serve him day and night in his temple. And the one seated on the throne will shelter them. These individuals, the great multitude, like the 144,000, are both before the throne and they're both redeemed. They were translated like the 144,000 as first fruits and they serve God in his temple. The question once again I raise here this morning, might the 144,000 and the great multitude be the same people, the same group? They do seem to start out as two groups, but somehow it appears like they're ending up as one. John the Revelator noted in beautiful imagery, lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion representing the administrative center of heaven, and with him 144,000 having his father's name written on their foreheads, okay, that'll be an identifying characteristic. They are not only citizens, but now in God's kingdom. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne. They are a special choir that can sing a certain song. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever they go. They are part of the retinue that followed Jesus, even in heaven. These were redeemed from among men, the first fruits under God and to the Lamb. They are the first of the redeemed as translated saints and without fault before the throne of God. They are uniquely placed before God's throne, perfect in character. That's another stunning list of additional clues in our study of the 144,000. They will become citizens of God's heavenly kingdom. They will be part of a special choir. They will know a special theme song. They will have special privileges in following Jesus. They are perfect. They are holy individuals. They will be positioned before that throne and God's name is on their foreheads. The church of the 144,000 is also the sixth church of the seven churches, the Philadelphia church. John identifies Christ who is speaking to him in that Philadelphia church as he that is holy and true and has the key of David to open and close the door that man cannot touch. The house of David became a symbol for the kingdom of God. Christ has authority over the key not keys, it should be just key, to the entryway, entryway of that kingdom. Who goes through that door? Those whom Christ has judged worthy. This is what he says about those in the Philadelphia church. He used that key and opened the door to his kingdom for them. I know thy works, Jesus said, behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Consequently, because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. That hour of temptation is a sermon in itself, what it means. God is sealing his people to protect them from a very specific period of time, a very short period of time, called the hour of temptation. On these individuals will eventually be written the name of God, the name of Jerusalem, and Christ's new name, this is really what makes up the seal 
of the 144,000. But wait, Ellen White said even after the saints are sealed with the seal of the living God, his elect will have trials individually. That's what we just read. Personal afflictions will come, but the furnace is closely watched by an eye that will not suffer the gold to be consumed. The indelible mark of God is upon them. God can plead that his own name is written there. The Lord has shut them in. Their destination is inscribed. God, New Jerusalem, they are God's property and his possessions forever. Do you want to be part of the 144,000? Ellen White invited us to crave to be among that group. You must experience an hour of temptation. Being sealed then, the great tribulation will be ahead of us. Terrible trials, terrible individual trials, and finally, a great multitude will be translated. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of God, and the name of the city of my God, which is the new Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from God from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. That's Jesus speaking. John saw a lamb on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000 having his father's name in their foreheads. They are the signet of heaven. They reflected the image of God and Jesus Christ perfectly. Ellen White also said the indelible mark of God is upon them, God can plead that his own name is written there. Can you imagine that? When we are sealed, even God can plead, they are mine because my name is written on their foreheads. The Lord has shut them in. Their destination is inscribed. God, New Jerusalem. They are God's property, his possession. The sealing represents those names on the forehead of the members of the Philadelphia Church. They are the 144,000 on their foreheads. Might this group be shown elsewhere in prophecy? Yes, in Revelation with the four living creatures is one example. And actually in many places, even in the Old Testament, and I've shared a little bit of that with you as we started. The white horse associated with the lion-like living creature that's the first seal represents the tribe of Judah, and that seal represents also the 144,000 that went out conquering and to conquer. The rider in that horse is Jesus Christ, and he has a bow but no arrows. In Hebrew symbology, if there's a bow a person has and no arrow, that means that the arrow has already left the bow and hit its target. The black horse is the great multitude waiting in darkness to be called out by those special operates forces, the white horse. I watched as the lamb opened the first of the seven seals. Then I heard one of the four living creatures say in voices like a thunder. Thunder in prophecy means there's some judicial phase it's happening come i looked and there before me was a white horse its rider held a bow there it is with no arrow and he was given a crown and he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest that crown is stephanopoulos it means a crown of victory horses represent people in battle white purity and holiness conquering and to conquer they win the battle because their rider is Jesus Christ. The 144,000 are God's group of kingdom citizens who recover the covenant blessings that he had originally given to Israel. That's a very crucial concept to understand. If you want to be among the 144,000, you'll be in that group of individuals that will be recovering the great covenant promises that was given originally to Abraham. And that will then take them into eternity. 
in the evening of September 8, 2009, a patrol of American trainers and Afghan forces were making their way into a valley to a village to talk with the elders. As they came near the outskirts of the village, all the lights went out. That usually meant trouble. They were ambushed from three sides. Taliban forces unleashed their fury on them. One mile away, Corporal Dakota and Staff Sergeant Chavez heard a GRD on the radio, the explosions and gunfire. Against orders, these two men hopped into their Humvee and raced towards that village. Dakota said, those Americans are my friends. They first found wounded Afghan soldiers. They loaded them and drove them back safely. The vehicle sustained many bullet holes. Back they went a second and third and fourth time, each episode getting out of the vehicle and loading the wounded. In the fifth and last run, the four Americans who had been trapped and wounded were rescued. Dakota sustained a bullet to his left arm. He later received a distinguished medal of honor from President Obama. Dakota and Chavez epitomized the 144,000 under intense resistance, even risking their lives. They will go out in a rescue mission for Jesus Christ. When the 144,000 make their view, and I saw another angel come down from heaven clothed with a cloud and a rainbow was upon his head. And his face was as were of sun and his feet as pillars of fire. That's Revelation 10, 1. That's when Jesus Christ comes down in the ceiling he cries and he's coming up. He's already on planet Earth symbolically. This is Christ because of the similarity to his description in Revelation 1, 12 through 16, and the association also with the cloud. This is a point in time when he comes symbolically down to help those who will be his final witnesses, the 144,000. That's incidentally one of the chapters, the 144,000, really need to master. And they need to master really what's in that little open book in that chapter. It will all begin as an early rain experience, which is another subject. In this preparation chapter, he comes with a rainbow of promise, authority over the whole world, his feet on earth and sea, filled with heaven's glory, his face is like a sun, ready to begin judicial work with his feet like legs and fire. Jesus helping them prepare for the final evangelistic meetings. The key preparation before witnessing here in Revelation 10 is to eat a little book that is opened so they can witness. That book is the unsealed portion of Daniel. I give you a reference in Ellen White's writings regarding that. There is a historical 1844 application of that prophecy and there is also an end time application, which is what we focus on in our ministry. Before the 144,000 go out, two very important events are recorded in Revelation 10 and 11. The preparation begins right after Jesus symbolically comes down. Then the judgment of the living of those who claim to be Christians begins. Then I was given a reed like a measuring rod, and the angel stood saying, rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. The Holy Spirit, that's Revelation 11, 1, that's the next chapter. Revelation 10 and 11 really should be one chapter, but that's how it has artificially been divided. And I will, and the Holy Spirit reigned before the 1260 days of witnessing in Earth's final call, and it says, and I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. This information is profound. Before the last three and a half years, the 144,000 will be commissioned to cry, behold, the bridegroom comes. There's another symbol of the 144,000 in the parable of the 10 virgins. 
we focus again on those 10 virgins. I think I've mentioned this before. But who cries, behold, the bridegroom is coming? Will they be sealed also before the great multitude figuratively comes on the scene? That comes later, after that hour of temptation. But they will have an early rain experience. The best way to simply understand this, an early rain experience, 144,000, preparation, a knowledge base, latter rain, great multitude, the trial of our faith, Sunday laws, and perhaps you could put underneath the Sunday laws the death decree, and then sealing for God's kingdom, and that's, they're completely made up in Malachi 3.17. Question, at the end of time, might these two groups really become one? This is where our study this morning becomes very important and very special. As early as 1846, expositor Ellen Harmon knew that and didn't elaborate on it. She says the living saints, 144,000 in number, and I'm quoting, knew and understood the voice while the wicked thought it was thunder and earthquake. When God spake the time, he poured out on us the Holy Ghost. That's the time that Jesus would be coming. And our faces began to lighten up and shine with the glory of God as Moses did when he came down from Mount Sinai. That quotation is also elaborated on in the book Great Controversy in the chapter God's People Delivered. These individuals are ready for translation. The living saints are those waiting to be translated Ellen White once again later on says those to be translated are the 144,000. This is all associated with the night of deliverance, Daniel 12.1. Probation has closed. Michael stands up. That's a transitional phrase in prophecy. Th this is when the cry rings through the universe. It is done. This is when chaos strikes the earth and the heavens. The stars fall, the suns turn black, the moon becomes like blood, the islands disappear, and the sky rolls back and forth. Then Christ appears as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. How many living saints are translated? How many saints go through the great tribulation, which are those that are translated according to Ellen White? I beheld and lo a great multitude which no man can number of all nations and kindreds and tongues and people stood before the throne and before the Lamb clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. These are they which came out of great tribulation and they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. The two translated groups have become one. They are made up of the witnesses, the 144,000, and the multitude that they bring in. That great tribulation is called Jacob's trouble, Jeremiah 30. Luke tells us when that occurs, it is just before Jesus comes. Scholars and expositors have concluded that the 144,000 represent the group that finishes the gospel work. They are distinct and are identified as receiving the seal of the living God. Their work brings in so many that they can't be counted, and they're translated. The sealing means that they are rooted deeply in Christ and his teaching and have become citizens of heaven. They are now protected. They have repented. This was brought out in our Sabbath school lesson this morning of all their sins. They put on the robe of Christ's righteousness, his perfection. And the context of Revelation 7 suggests that the great multitude merges into the 144,000 and they become one. There are symbols in the Old Testament that teach the same thing, which obviously is another subject to, to present. They are translated without seeing death. They are called the first fruits. 
they keep the commandments of God and have the testimony and faith of Jesus. And also, according to Ezekiel 9, they hate sin. 18th century's correction in the 18th century, evangelist George Whitfield preached three to four times a day. History tells us between the age of 22 and 55 when he passed away. He spoke in England, Wales, Scotland, Ireland, seven times in the American colonies. Imagine 144,000 George Whitfields at the end of time. What kind of soul harvest might that reap? God is now looking for those messengers. In fact, he is calling with a loud voice. Will you say yes to that call and be among the 144,000? To do that means you're willing to give up everything, give up anything, even your life. It means that there is a very intense preparation a knowledge base to be ready. Helen White says, drive to be among the 144,000. That means a lot of intense work on our part. It's not a fantasy world, but it's a world where we will be working intensely for Jesus Christ. Are you willing to go through that preparation? Will you decide this morning to be among that group? If so, let's bow our heads. Our Heavenly Father, we need to be and we pray that you'll help us to be more than armchair Adventist. We pray that you'll help us to be more than armchair Christians, but that we will stand up and be willing to work to teach, to fight, to represent you completely in the truths that you've described in your holy word. We really want to be part of that group to help finish the work. But we realize with a brief overview this morning that that's going to require a lot of preparation, a lot of heart searching, and a lot of commitment to you a forever commitment to you. I pray, Lord, that this group here this morning will have that resolve. In Jesus' name, amen.